Well, thanks for um, um, coming this long. It's <laughs> you've uh, had a, a really good um, uh, set of sessions here from our guest speakers. Have been really edified um, by what we've heard today. So, really do appreciate you guys coming out. And uh, so we have another round of questions, and um, look forward to uh, yeah, just to hearing you guys interact, and and we'll go from there. So. Um, the first question is, um, um, an, un an unbeliever asked me how God, how God can be good when there's so many bad things that happen in the world. I can answer the question for myself, <clears throat> but I struggle explaining it with empathy to an unbeliever. And so again, the question is, um, how can God be good when there are so many bad things that happen in the world? <clears throat> Do I have the microphone first this time for a reason? <laughs> well, that's providence. Um, most of the time when we talk to unbelievers, they're trying to figure out a way that they can not be under the word, but over the word, just as I alluded to earlier. And they're trying to rationalize, assuage their consciences, uh, find some hole in the Bible so that they're not going to be judged by God. And I want to be nice to unbelievers and give them answers to questions. But I usually say something like that to them. I know you're asking me these questions because you feel the weight of your conscience and you see creation and you know God is powerful and you see his invisible attributes and there's enough of God out there to judge you and you're trying to get out from underneath his judgment by asking me questions like the Bible's on trial. But my friend, you're really the one on trial. And so one day you will stand before God and you won't be asking the questions. There'll be a divine verdict. And so let me tell you the way of escape found through Christ Jesus. Uh, there are some things that you just can't know because you're finite and you're fallen. Uh, but the real question for all of evil, I think, centers at the cross where um, how could God plan that, Acts 2 and Acts 4, yet these men could be so evil and so wicked. Did God ordain sin? The answer has to be yes, because he ordained the death of his son. And that was the worst sin that was ever committed. So how can God override evil might be a good question. He allows it, yes. He ordains it, yes. But he overrides it and he makes it work out for something wonderful, i.e. salvation. So I usually try to turn it back around on people, and I also like to tell people, you know, Kushner, uh, Rabbi Kushner's book is, is wrongly stated. Why do bad things happen to good people? The real question is the opposite, right? How can God so graciously, through common grace, give so many wonderful things to people who are rebels? Taste buds. I mean, you can taste salt, and you can taste sweet, and you can taste... Uh, I don't know. What else do we like to have around here? What? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Taste buds and the joys of uh, being a grandparent and the joys of, of marriage and all kinds of things and sight and sound and music. God gives wonderful things to people that are rebels. Uh, and so I think we need to ask the question the right way. And uh, they usually don't because they're trying to examine God. And I think the sooner we can get to who God is, the Son, the better. What did Paul do in a day and age when people knew the Bible, the Jews? He went right to the Bible and started quoting the Bible. When he met people at Mars Hill, Areopagus, he went straight to God as a creator. So when I met a young man in India, I said, which gods do you worship? Because I knew he worshiped several. I mean, there's only 330 million gods in a, a country of 1.2 billion. And he said, and... I, I wasn't shocked, but he said, I worship the sex God, the money God, and the power God. And I thought, what 21-year-old man wouldn't if he was an unbeliever? And so I said, see that up there? That's the sun. Yes, oh yeah, that's the sun. I said, I worship the God that created the sun, and he created you. And since you're a created being, he requires obedience from you perfect obedience, and then went into the gospel. So that's kind of one of my approaches. There are a variety of approaches. Yeah, point him to Mike's last sermon. Good answers. <laughs> um, <clears throat> one question was, um, uh, what can the small, isolated churches who share our beliefs and values do to help establish more churches in our areas? 
Keep preaching the gospel and, um, you know, uh, be aggressively evangelistic. I, I think the perhaps the, the biggest deficiency in uh, contemporary evangelicalism, really for the past 200 years or so, has been an unnecessary timidity when it comes to proclaiming the gospel, speaking the truth. We, uh, you know, so crave the world's admiration and... Uh, um, as I said, I think in my message, that's, that's foreign to what Scripture commands us to do. We're sent out into the world to proclaim the good news, and not everybody's going to respond to it well. And so when people respond badly, it doesn't mean you've done a bad job. Uh, but I think people get discouraged by that, the fact that the world so frequently rejects the message uh, that it's, it's caused modern evangelicals uh, because of our fascination with popular culture and the media and all that, it's caused people to back away from speaking the truth because it's just not popular. Even in, in a lot of Christian um, sort of subcultures, uh, that's what the seeker-sensitive church is all about. It's an attempt to frame the message in a way that tiptoes around the hard truths, uh, which sort of it defangs the gospel and waters it down a bit and we need you back to proclaiming the gospel in a in a just a clear unvarnished way it's not a complex message as you've heard all week um, um, it's, it's simple and uh, deliberately so uh, and we should not be ashamed of it now, there's a reason Paul said I'm not ashamed of the gospel because there is that tendency. Was it you or one of you guys read from Martin Lloyd Jones saying, you know, that uh, if you're not ashamed of the gospel, it's probably because you've never really understood it. That's a really good point. Uh, that I think I think um, so many leading evangelicals in the 20th century, especially, uh, tried so hard to frame the gospel in terms that would not be offensive to anybody. And in, in so doing, they've corrupted even the evangelical community's understanding of what the gospel is and, uh, and just sort of emasculated the gospel. Yeah, definitely like take a marketing class, right? And, and read church growth books. That, that's what's needed, right? And, and survey the community around you to, to make sure that you find out exactly what would draw people to come to the church. Bouncy houses is always good, right? You guys aren't going to make me rebuke you, are you? Like, okay, okay, I was expecting tomatoes or something, but yeah. Uh, sadly, that, that's, that's the evangelicalism today, sadly. And, uh, and that is the problem. That's not the solution. That's the problem. Absolutely. That is not the solution. And well, we need to call that out. Uh, Phil said it as perfectly as you could say it. Preach the gospel. Let God do the work that God has promised to do if we're just faithful to preach the gospel. Um, Howell Harris was a... Um a contemporary of George Whitfield, he preached in Wales, and um, Lloyd Jones figured he was a better preacher than Whitfield. But uh, w I, reading a biography on him, um, the th one of the interesting things is he got saved, and then he just started going to his neighbors, going door to door, going to villages to talk to people about it and to share the gospel with them. And then when uh, he just start, kept preaching. He was learning, growing, and, and Whitfield and these other guys were just out preaching. And and then we think of the first great awakening in that time, and we we maybe long for that fruitfulness and love to see something like that happen. Um, but these guys also, they just went out and and they they preached and they tried to reach their neighbors, and they also were like shot at and had dead animals thrown at them. And uh, so there's a lot of great fruit, but they also you know, stuck their neck out there and were reviled and hated by many and persecuted greatly. So they, they it was not like it was just, oh, you know, it would have been easy back then to just do this. Uh, it's not the case. You know, they, they preached and, and they, they went out and they, they just proclaimed the gospel and some people hated them, some people believed. So um, to, just to their point, just, uh, I mean, we may, not, we may not see that kind of fruit. We have no guarantees of that, but that's what we're called to do. And, and 
we'll pray that the Lord answers prayer and saves people. And back to the question, um, the second part of the question about smaller churches doing things together. I mean, there is a bad ecumenism, but there's a healthy ecumenism. And uh, if the church gets the gospel right, and you think about they have a high view of Scripture and a high view of the, the Word of God, uh, sorry, a high view of Christ's work, then there's probably things you could do together, right? Like doing a conference like this where you can uh, pool resources and for the time being set aside eschatological differences and, and how the church is run. Is it an elder rule or congregational rule and say, well, let's bring in some speakers or let's have some evangelistic training or something like that. I think that's wonderful. But lots of times I want to tell those churches, if you're doing it because um, you want to equip and to encourage and to be a better evangelist, fine, that's a good reason. But don't do it to get bigger. There's nothing wrong with the small church. I hate it when people say, well, Mike, how big's your church? And I usually lie and I say, oh, about 3,000, I don't really count. <laughs> and then I say, no, I don't know, 300? I mean, that's not my responsibility, how many people come to the church, especially if I think the church that I'm pastoring uh, is in a town of 5,000 people. And you know, how many Twitter followers do you have? When I tried to get books published, how many Twitter followers do you have? What's the bandwidth of your radio? How many downloads? How many books? And I, I thought this was Christian ministry. Uh, I thought 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 2, stewards are, found, are, are required to be found what? Faithful. My wife always says, faithful, not fabulous. And... Uh, <laughs> A lot of people preach the gospel better than I do, but nobody preaches a better gospel. But you are, you are fabulous. Okay, thank you. Uh, do you have Forever 21 stores here? Um, so the, the point is, don't let all these people tell you you've got to have all these big churches. It, it matters not how big your church is. Uh, I think 90% of all churches in America have 150 people or less. So, so why are we trying to scurry around with... Um, the four P's of marketing and product and place and price and promotion and everything else. I know it's harder if you're a small church for missions budgets and trying to pay the pastor and all these things. Yes, there are problems, uh, but God is the Lord of the church and our responsibility is to be... F What's going on now? Oh, okay. Thank you. Well, we can make it even more fabulous because I have to shave my legs because of bicycling. So just keep, just push it. Just push it. Always causes a family fight in our family when my legs are smoother than my wife's legs. Okay. Well, you can hold that. I got this. And with that, we'll <laughs> Okay, well, next question. Uh, and by the way, one of the things that we have uh, as Christians, we can have joy and we can laugh and we're not having to go work for our salvation right now. It's been done and we can rest. And I think some of these things and even the giggles and laughs and all that stuff, I just think, you know, Lord, I'm sure I don't do this uh, often, but I want to be a, an advertisement for a joyful Calvinist. Somebody who's happy and, and not this kind of stern, overbearing, can't have fun. We can have the most fun. Okay, sorry. <laughs> what are we doing tonight? <laughs> uh, here's a question that I like, and uh, it, it asks, what does shepherding your family look like for a man? Short question. We should ask the older guys first. That's a good idea. <laughs> and uh, could you also make an addendum to that? Um, tell us a little bit about your boots as a t part two. The boots? <laughs> it's my footwear. Uh, shepherding. There are, there are really three uh, aspects, to, three main aspects to a shepherd's responsibility. He is to feed, lead, and guard. And uh, it's as simple as that. And uh, in fact, I recently preached on this um, but, uh, because I was responding to something Andy Stanley had said, where he said he thought we ought to lose the shepherding metaphor. It doesn't work anymore. And uh, 
Um, so I responded to him in a sermon. You can look up that sermon online. I think it's from two weeks ago. Uh, but that was one of the points I made, is that the shepherding metaphor in Scripture is chosen carefully because the tasks of a shepherd are the tasks of a pastor. And in fact, the word pastor actually means shepherd. And as a father or the head of a household, you are you, you serve a similar role in your home uh, as the shepherd. Your duty is to feed, and that means not just physical food, but spiritually feed and lead and guard your family. And that's a father's responsibility, and uh, woe to the father who delegates that responsibility to his wife or anyone else in the household. Good answer. This is a super good answer. <laughs> um, I just was trying to think of First Samuel and an illustration of somebody who didn't do that thing with his children, and the man's name was Eli. And if you would like to have an illustration of the opposite of what Phil just articulated, yeah. it is in First Samuel chapter 2. Um, with those sons and how he responded to those sons. Just a side note on parenting and shepherding. I think we should teach our children the Bible, high view of God, and there should be family times of worship and devotion and memory and singing hymns. Uh, but I think you all ought also, uh, as parents, strive to have fun with your kids. And I want your children to grow up thinking, you know what, I'd like to be just like my mom and dad instead of I just like to be like everybody else and um, I'm going to go have fun down the street. My wife is really the one who drives this, but I want the neighborhood kids to all say, let's go down to Mike and Kim's house because that's where we're going to have the most fun. And if I told you the number one goal of parenting uh, is fun, I would be wrong, but it's, it's up there. Uh, I know it's the salvation of our kids, but I can't do that so I could teach them the Bible, but I can also let them know, you know, when it comes to the word shalom and uh, peace and uh, well-being, uh, because of who the Lord is, we get to just have a great and wonderful life. And uh, everything we receive is from the hand of God. And so let's just enjoy it. And you see that metaphor in Ecclesiastes, do you not? The meaning of life is not found in life. It's found in the one who gives life. Therefore, chapter 5, enjoy. Chapter 9, enjoy. Chapter 11, enjoy. Because God has provided all these things for you from his hand. We get to enjoy all these things from the Lord. Isn't the Lord good? Hasn't the Lord blessed our family? And I'm not talking about with riches. I'm talking about with things like food and clothing and just fellowship and fun. So I don't want people in our circles to be so driven on, you know, you've, you, you've got to do 40 questions of the catechism by tomorrow and grinding these things in the kids without, I don't know, bribing them to do it, I guess. <laughs> and lots of times we did do things on the overkill, and uh, I, I wish I could kind of go back, but I'm thankful that the Lord uh, makes up for a lot of my deficiencies. Okay. Um Kind of an interesting question. How do you discern when someone is generally needy or just lazy and wants to take advantage of the kindness of others? <laughs> Time? Time? I mean, yeah. we, we have to watch, right? We, we uh, Discernment is not I instantaneous. We, we have to we have to observe we have to, i mean part of the part of the the role of being a, a shepherd and this would include in, in your family as well is watching the sheep watching the flock uh, observing what's what's going on and 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 then responding to the needs that you see in the flock i i don't know how else to answer the question that's the right answer i got something right <laughs> <laughs> okay um, Galatians 3 verse 1 uh, says O foolish Galat uh, Galatians who hath bewitched you that ye should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth crucified among you and so that's the verse and the question is how far can believers 
be drawn away from the truth and still be saved. For instance, how do we view Billy Graham's linking arms ecumenically and his statement that non-believers can be saved? Was he bewitched or what does that mean? Yeah, that's a pretty complex question, but it's a great one. And um, it's one that, that while Paul dances around it in the Galatian epistles, I mean, he starts that epistle, like I said earlier today, with a double curse against anyone who would preach a different gospel. He doesn't have the same condemnation against people who are, in, in his words there, bewitched by the gospel. But he does say later on, I think it's later in chapter 3, he says, I'm concerned for you. And by that he meant, he's concerned, maybe their faith re isn't really genuine. He doesn't, he doesn't uh, precipitously pass a harsh judgment against them and say, yo, you foolish Galatians, you've listened to these false teachers and now that's proof that you're not Christians. He, he confronts them with the truth and he pleads with them and he says, I'm worried about you, I'm, I'm uh, you know, concerned, I think is the word he uses, concerned about you. Uh, so he, he lets them know in every way he can that uh, their, their wavering on the truth of the gospel is a matter of deep concern for him, and he's not really sure whether their testimony of faith in Christ is really going to bear the fruit of proof of genuine salvation. Uh, the question also had something there about Billy Graham, uh, and I, I'll, I'll just say, Candidly, I did not approve of Billy Graham's consorting with Roman Catholics and other unbelievers. And I think a lot of what he did, unfortunately, clouded the gospel. When he preached, when he preached the gospel, he preached it with great clarity. And that's why he had, I think, an effective and widespread ministry. But I think he did a lot of harm to the evangelical movement by encouraging people to engage in these ecumenical enterprises with people who clearly taught a different gospel. I mean, it's what he did, in my view, is just plain disobedience to what Paul was saying there in Galatians 1. If somebody comes with a different gospel, you know, let him be a curse. Don't treat him as a Christian. And uh, I didn't see ever much evidence that Billy Graham was willing to make that kind of judgment with anyone. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't automatically say, well, I don't think he was saved either, because he preached the gospel, he affirmed the gospel. And for me, that's sort of the dividing line. Uh, I'm not going to accuse someone of being a non-Christian unless he's actually denied some essential gospel truth. I may be very critical of his doctrine. He may be full of errors that I will uh, you know, even tweet about or whatever, but that doesn't mean necessarily that I think that person's not a true believer. If, I, if, if, if he's denying some essential gospel doctrine, then that's the only conclusion you can come to. But I think that's sort of uh, the, the last step in, in writing someone off. Um, you, you know, dealing with sin in the body is a similar kind of situation. In Matthew 18, Jesus says, if you see a brother in sin, confront him privately, and you, maybe you'll win your brother. And if he doesn't respond, then you go with a second witness, and maybe he'll respond to two of you. And then if he doesn't respond, then you tell it to the church, that's step three, and the whole church goes after him, pursuing his repentance. And if he refuses the whole church, if he just ultimately refuses to repent, then Jesus says, let him be unto you as a tax collector and a, and a Gentile. In other words, you, you assume, for the sake of argument, that because of his refusal, his steadfast refusal to heed any appeal to repent, you have to assume he's not really a believer. Uh, and that, even that, though, I don't think means that uh, that's definitive proof he's not a believer, because I've seen people actually go through the four stages of discipline, be excommunicated, and then, you know, two years later, they come to their senses and repent. Uh, and, and so I would say, you know, the fact that he ultimately repented was sufficient proof to me that, you know, his faith must have been genuine. What a believer will not do, and in fact, this is in the, the Westminster Confession, in the section on perseverance. It affirms that we believe a person who is truly saved will persevere in the faith. But then it goes on to say, he may for a time fall into even egregious sins and may even continue for a time in those sins. Um, uh, but he will ultimately, if, if he's a genuine believer, he will ultimately heed the call to repent. And um, so we wouldn't conclude that someone 
is a non-believer unless he fully and finally falls away. He, he has to deny the gospel, renounce Christ, before I would make such a harsh accusation against anyone. Yeah. When Billy Graham said, uh, I think there are other ways to heaven, and remember that interview, I wrote Billy Graham Association uh, a letter asking them for clarification, and I got back a response, which I was glad for, and the response was, Billy has always taught there's one way of salvation and that you have to hear about Christ. And faith comes by hearing the message about Jesus, uh, Romans 10. And I thought to myself, so many years he has talked about death, burial, and resurrection and the response of belief and faith. I think he's too old and he's got bad advice and there's a time where you take the microphone away from Grandpa. Right? When I start talking like that, then I should be having the elders tell me, or the board tell me, it, it, it's time for you to stop. And so if Billy was 40 and he started saying that, I would really wonder. But since he was so old and he was saying that, and he already was on that slippery slope, even back with Lloyd-Jones, uh, Graham goes to Lloyd-Jones in the 50s probably and said, you know, would you please be the host for my crusades? And Lloyd-Jones says, yes. Uh, as long as you don't have apostates up on the stage and you don't have altar calls where you'll send people back to the Catholic Church. And of course, Graham wouldn't want to do that, so Lloyd-Jones said no. Uh, so I, I, I think of um, MacArthur's mentor, Feinberg, and how he was a uh, Orthodox Jew who got saved, and then when he lost his mind, he reverted back to Judaism. And I think John tells a story, the only vestige of uh, Christianity that Feinberg held onto in the rest home was he would try to call the uh, nurses together for a staff meeting, a seminary staff meeting, or something like that. So I just think when I start talking about Jesus isn't the only way, that's the time my elders need to say, okay, we love you, but that's enough. You're done. I think, I think what Phil said is important, too, the, the clouded, the clouded the gospel because, because there are people watching that, that frankly don't know the difference between Roman Catholicism and, 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 and true gospel. And, and, and they watch this and they just assume, well, it, it's all the same then. And, and his credibility gives credence to to Catholicism and yeah, we, we just got to be really careful. And just to add to that, um, if somebody in advanced age or, or what have you, maybe they get dementia and they act differently than before, like they act like an unbeliever, but before that point, by all accounts, they were a believer. Uh, what do you make of that um, scenario? Yeah, I, I think charity uh, would would sort of oblige us to assume that if a person's not in his right mind, and there's reasons to think that other than the fact that you know he's reverted back to his unsafe state or whatever, uh, you, you just have to figure he, he's not in his right mind and he's not fully responsible for everything he's saying. Uh, yeah, the Feinberg case is an interesting one because he was. He was literally, for a time, the most knowledgeable evangelical in the world when it came to uh, Old Testament, New Testament, because he'd, he had studied literally to be a rabbi before he was saved. And then he was soundly converted and taught in seminary, in Christian seminary, for, I don't know, decades. He was John MacArthur's mentor. Uh, but it's true that he got some kind of dementia. I don't know if it was Alzheimer's disease or what and lapsed back to where he didn't even remember having become a Christian. And it troubled his family a great deal. And uh, they ultimately asked John MacArthur to do his funeral and uh, because John had been so close to him. And John's comment was, yeah, that, it, that, that wasn't the real Charles Feinberg. Uh, that was a man who'd, who's, whose brain was uh, subject to the decrepitude of old age and, and uh, all of that would be made whole and glorified in heaven. And since he never, he never actually denied Christ or renounced Christ, or, or um, in this, in the sense that he, he just simply didn't remember that he had been converted. He reverted back to childhood in many ways, and um, it wasn't as if he said, "Yeah, I know I profess to be converted, but now I renounce that and I want to return to Judaism." That would have been very troubling. 
but it was more that he just he forgot half his life he forgot actually two-thirds of his life mm -hmm. and uh, I don't think you should make too much of that it's like uh, people occasionally in hospital visits I'll, I'll encounter people who are on some sort of drug or chemotherapy or whatever that alters their mind and it can make a very sweet tempered person mean you know and when medicine or disease can do that to your mind I think you have to assume that uh, um, uh, when someone has dementia you can't you can't hold them morally responsible for everything they say or don't say In Mike's um, <clears throat> first sermon, he had mentioned some of the books uh, like Heaven is for Real and others uh, where people talk about their personal experiences with heaven and hell. Um, do you encourage or discourage people from these books and why? <laughs> Me? For, it's for all, anyone. <laughs> oh. Well, I think they make good kindling, so I encourage that. <laughs> We used to have a segment on No Compromise Radio, book burning or page, a book burner or page turner. And then that, you know, foolish man burned the Quran down in Florida. So that ended that segment of the show. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, I try not to encourage people to read those books because they need encouragement to read other books, better books. And so even if you use the slogan, good, better, best, I'm trying to give books to people that will really edify them and encourage them. They can pick up enough through popular culture and their grandma's book stand and other people that they know in their life who've read those books. They don't need to go buy that to try, try to understand it. You know, you can read a Tim Challies review on Heaven is for Real and you know, you, you don't need to read the book, right? You don't need to read Jesus Calling um, you can read a review on it quickly. So let's read books that are good instead of, in place of, to try to encourage. I think if you're a church, uh, one of the things that we did early on is we said, let's have a bookstore where we can sell church, uh, sell to the church books at our cost to try to help them. What's the best book on hermeneutics, on the attributes of God, on marriage? So people could walk in and say, you know what, that's an important book. And I, I went around and I would tell young men that I was discipling, you need to read this book. And I think churches need to give their pastor not only their own personal book budget, but a book bu budget where he can be giving out books. You need to read this book. You've got to read this Bettner book. You've got to read this, you know, whatever it might be uh, to try to really help people read because Christians uh, need to be reading. I think Wesley even said, Christian pastors, you need to read four hours a day or get out of the ministry. I mean, we are readers. Uh, people go, well, I'm a visual learner. Uh, well, yes, you're a visual learner when it comes to natural creation. But you're a different kind of learner when it comes to God revealing himself, as Luther said, with Greek and Hebrew letters. And so I just think, you know, a lot of those books, I don't say to people, let's have a discernment book club ministry. Let's read that so we can see the errors. Uh, I'd rather have them something, hand them something that's really excellent to read and say, you know what, you've got to read this book. It's so good. And then I give them the book for free. I, I think one of the one of the ministries that I think the the pastor needs to be really involved in, maybe not principally running, but it, is the the church library. Um, um, how many of you are in churches where you would find books in your library, like Heaven Is for Real or or Joyce Meyer or you know you name it? Um, I, what you should do is you should check those books out of your library and forget to return them or something. Use them, yeah, burn them. Uh, yeah, I, it, it, and, and it's everywhere. I mean, our, our culture is just absolutely filled. Go, I, I'm sorry, go to the local Christian bookstore. Almost everything in it needs to be burned. I, it's, the, it's just the truth. So, Can I ask for clarity on the question? Was the person asking, is there anything good about that book? Or were they asking, is there value in reading those kinds of books just to be able to critique them? What no, was the question? No, it's more uh, addressing um, 
why we should not read the books. Yeah, because I because want to be really clear. Those are bad books to read. I mean, if you're right. reading them in order to do a, crit a critique, you might, you might need to read a book like that. I've had to read all of those books uh, because I edited a book by John MacArthur called uh, The Glory of Heaven, in which he dealt with some of those. And so I read them all. And it was interesting because they all disagree with each other. All these people have had visions of heaven, and they're all different. And so you know that they're not all right. And in fact, the fact that if you compare them to the very few uh, snippets in Scripture where people did have legitimate visions of heaven, Paul said he was transported into the third heaven, and he didn't know if it was a vision or if it was real. So his was the most sort of vivid thing. And he said it, he saw things it's not even lawful to talk about. So he wouldn't even, he didn't give a description of heaven. He just mentioned that he'd been there. And then the descriptions you have are in the apocalypse, for example, the, the apostle John describes scenes in heaven that accord perfectly with scenes in heaven that you see in Isaiah and Ezekiel. And other than that, I, I can't off the top of my head think of any biblical descriptions of heaven. The Ezekiel account is so mysterious as to, I dare you to try to paint the picture. You can't, you can't envision it from what he says. And that's part of the point. He's saying heaven is more spectacular than anything you've ever imagined. And the best he could describe it to you is a, a scene you can't even picture in your mind. And similarly with Isaiah, in Isaiah 6, his point is to, to talk about how unworthy he felt in the midst of the, the throne and the worship of God in heaven. But there's very little detail given to us. And these modern books about heaven are full of all kinds of fanciful and ridiculous details. And, um, and so I, I wrote a blog post about this a few years ago. And um, one of the books I named was um, about, uh, it was written by a man whose last name is Malarkey. And, um, and his son, Alex Malarkey, was involved in a car accident when he was, I think, five or six years old. And permanently paralyzed and so the dad wrote this book that was full of all these visions that his son supposedly had of heaven and um, and I, I basically wrote a blog post that says these things can't be true here are, here are a few things that contradict scripture etc this kid never really went to heaven and I got a phone call later the, that day after the blog post was published and I was in a meeting, so I got a message saying, Mrs. Malarkey called and wants to talk to you. So I called her back thinking that, you know, she was going to be really angry with me for questioning her husband's book. But uh, she said, I am so thankful you wrote that article. She said, that book is full of lies. And my son, who's supposedly the one who had these visions, has been trying for two years to tell the publisher and everybody else that the stuff in that book isn't even true. And, um, and so I wrote an article to that effect. And in fact, John MacArthur's book on heaven hadn't been published yet. So we got the, that part of the story into the book before it was published. And all that was still out there for two years, uh, quoting Mrs. Malarkey and little Alex saying, he's not little anymore, by the way, he's graduated from high school now. Um, but the saying that this, this stuff is not even true. And believe it or not, people came on Facebook and rebuked Alex for claiming that his, his dad's account of his visions of heaven weren't true. It was, the whole thing was so disturbing. And it, what it showed me is that there's something in the human psyche that so desires to hear these tales about things that aren't lawful to speak about and that we can't see and believe them, that people wanted to hear the stories even though the person who supposedly had these visions was saying, it's not true, it's not true. Uh, and it wasn't until, actually I think Jordan Hall and um, uh, Pulpit and Penn ran an open letter from Alex Malarkey basically saying these stories are not true. He had, he had made up some of this, the tales as a little kid because as he said, when you're paralyzed from the neck down and lying in bed and, and people are transfixed with your tales, you, you can spin some pretty wild stories. But he said he never expected those to be published in a book and that people would claim these are visions from God. And some, some of the news media picked up that story and ran it. And thankfully, I think that has helped 
to put an end to what was, for a brief time there, just an endless stream of these Visions of Heaven books. Seriously, there were from evangelical publishers more than a dozen books like that within a couple of years' time, and some of them became bestsellers. So all of that is to say, I think those books are positively dangerous, and uh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't I, although I liked, I liked his answer, I, I would say more than just, there are better things you can read. I would say, don't read those books. Don't read those books unless you have to, because they're full of lies, and uh, that can't be healthy for you. Somebody asked a, a follow-up question just asking, is it possible some of these stories are true? And, and I, would just, I would just read from, from 2 Corinthians 12, and, and Paul's, Paul's uh, bodily or, or spiritual journey to heaven, uh, he, he doesn't even know. And, and he says, I, I know this man was caught up into paradise, whether in the body or out of the body, I don't know. Uh, God knows. And he heard things, and, and listen to how strongly he puts it. He, I heard things that cannot be told. And which man may not utter. May is a word of permission. Man does not have permission, even if he, he didn't have permission to, to describe. And, and even if he did have permission, he could not put it into words. It wasn't possible. I mean, read Ezekiel 1, and you tell me what that's about. I have no idea. He tried. He could not put it into words that we can understand. Yes, and um, just one other verse. From the lips of Jesus himself, John 3, 13, no one has ascended into heaven, but he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And now there are those rare exceptions of prophetic visions in Scripture that are given to us, but... but it, these people who claim that they were literally caught up into heaven and start spinning long tales about it, that's so contrary to everything Scripture says that in answer to the follow-up question, no, they're all lies. I think it's a matter of are we content with Scripture or not? God could have said more things, but he didn't. And so even with our charismatic friends and mystic friends is your heart content with what God has revealed. He's decided what to put in and what not to put in, and so do I just rest in that? And that goes true for sovereignty of God and human responsibility and hypostatic union and all kinds of other mysteries. Uh, so am I content with the Word of God? And there's so much there to study um, that should help us be even more content. On that note, my Armenian pastor often uses 2 Peter 3.9 to say that God doesn't desire that anyone perish. Uh, so how do I address that? You got the PhD, man. No, I don't. <laughs> I'll take that. Okay. that. That is a hard question. There are several possible answers to that one. Uh, let me just say that... Um, any, any of the language you find in Scripture about the desires of God, we call that optative language. Optative language speaks of desire and specifically unfulfilled desire. Those are, those are often sort of figures of speech that can't be true of God if you think about it. He says he does all his good pleasure. Uh, at the end of history, he won't have any unfulfilled desires. So whatever that means, it doesn't describe... We're not to think of it as, as some sort of wish or longing from God that he couldn't possibly make happen. Because he is sovereign, and, and Scripture is very clear that he does all his good pleasure. So what does it mean? I mean, you see places in Ezekiel, for example, Ezekiel 18, where he pleads with sinners and says, Why would you die? Uh, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. Uh, and I think while those, those are not to be taken literally in the sense of these are unfulfilled desires uh, about the will of God. Nevertheless, they do tell us something about God, and I think we're supposed to take them uh, in the same way we take any of the language about God with his mood changes. God's mood doesn't change. That's, that's what theologians call uh, impassibility. 
God isn't subject to mood swings and temper tantrums. So when it says, for example, that the Lord was angry, it doesn't mean he changed his mood or he changed his mind because God isn't a man that he should change his mind. What it means is, is or, or what it aims to designate to us is the fact that God, who hates sin, and he hates it, we know because God is unchanging, he hates it with an intense passion that doesn't rise and fall, fluctuate and change, but there are times in his dealings with us when his wrath against sin comes more to the forefront of how he deals with us, and other times when he, he, he demonstrates his grace, all of those are perfections of God that don't fluctuate, but he shows them to us in different ways. And so I would say that anytime you find language, this is just my first part of the answer, anytime you find language in scripture that expresses a desire from God that seems to be an unfulfilled desire. You have to understand that's that's what we call an anthropopathism. It's like an anthropomorphism, which I think you probably would recognize that term. Anthropomorphism means uh, you ascribe body parts to God. Scripture speaks of the eyes of the Lord, of the hand of the Lord. And we know God doesn't have body parts. Well, he also doesn't have emotions that rise and fall. And when Scripture seems to attribute these emotions or unfulfilled desires to God. It's using anthropopathisms. It's explaining God in terms we can understand, but there's enough in scripture that makes it clear we're not to think that God is just like us. He doesn't have emotions that are subject to rising and falling. I wrote a whole article on this a few years ago that you can find on the web if you just do a search at Google for the word impassibility and my name and you'll find it. Um, and, um, and then I'll leave it to Abendroth to explain that specific text. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, one of the first things I do with the book is I ask myself the question, to whom is this book addressed? Chapter 1, verse 1 gives us the answer. Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ to those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours by the righteousness of God and Savior, of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So he's writing to believers, and you see in the text, even <clears throat> in verse uh, uh, 1, I'm writing to you, beloved of chapter 3, and then he's trying to answer this question, uh, is the world set up in such a way where uh, it's the same old, same old. Whatever happened yesterday is going to happen today, or is there an end to history? Is history circular, or is there an end? And so Paul writes you know, with the beloved word in verse 8 as well, but do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you. The ones he's writing to, the beloved. He's, he's patient, not wishing that any should perish. Is that any person who's ever born or any of you? But that all should reach repentance. And so I think he's saying, if I could put it in different terms, theological terms, are you glad that God is patient as he draws the elect unregenerate to himself? Or do you want him to come back today? I, I want him to come back today, but I'm glad that every unregenerate elect person will come to faith. And so that's why God has slowed down the process. And when that elect, last elect person has come to faith, it will be over. And so I don't think we can say with the NIV, he wants everyone to come repentance. Because if God wants everyone, I think he's going to get what he wants. And so any is better. And I think the antecedent of any is any of you. There's also a note. If you if you look it up in the ESV, the, it, it gives a, a, a footnote there. Uh, some manuscripts actually say, "But God is patient," uh, and and it says, "On account of you." And and I think that's really helpful uh, language there, beloved. On account of you, God is being patient. God is not going to allow any of His elect to slip through the cracks. He's going to save everyone. Okay, my son is in a Christian school, not me, but somebody, uh, 
uh, is in a Christian school and they are reading the shack for English class. Uh, mm. So what would you do in that situation? I, I would ask how Christian is the Christian school, <laughs> frankly. I, my guess is it's probably no more Christian than most of the Christian churches. I would protest loudly. Protest. I think his first movie was pretty good, Shaq Fu. Wasn't that pretty good? <laughs> okay. Oh, sorry. Shaquille O'Neal was in a movie. <laughs> basketball player. You guys have basketball here? <laughs> <laughs> he did he did yeah yeah uh, it's a complex question how it works out practically but i think that'd be a good time for you to have a little meeting uh, a parent teacher conference can we get together and talk about this i have some concerns about the shack. Uh, I'm glad you're reading The Hiding Place, Corey Ten Boom. I'm glad you're reading whatever books they're reading that are good, but I have some concerns about this. And sometimes teachers get busy, sadly, and they don't even know the modalism that's found there. They don't even understand how the caricature of uh, the third person, the Trinity, is so unholy. And uh, I don't want my kids reading books like that, uh, but if you're going to put your children in a school setting, public or private, they're probably going to read things you don't don't want them to read so you parents need to read those books and then sit down with your kids to work through that for kind of discernment hour can you find um, for as many mistakes as you find in this book I'll give you one dollar type of thing <laughs> US <laughs> it's worth 28 cents more <laughs> okay um, if the sinner's prayer, in quotes, uh, can lead to a false conversion, uh, then how do we ensure our repentance or prayer for repentance is sincere? And how is that shown when we uh, may or will continually fall into that same sin? I hope that is clear. I can read it again if you'd like. Yeah. So if, if the sinner's prayer can lead to a false conversion, and you might want to ask, what they mean by the sinner's prayer, but uh, how do we ensure our repentance or prayer for repentance is sincere, and how is that shown when we um, continually fall into the sin that we're repenting of, I guess? Um, I guess they're asking if, what, what weight do we put on a sinner's prayer? Um, and how can we know our repentance is genuine in, in that regards, I guess? If I could understand that. So, um, yeah, I'll take a crack. Um, one thing, the um, just depending on what we mean by sinner's prayer, I guess, and, and, and what that looked like. So if it's, uh, so I was, when I was six, um, was at a puppet show at this church, and then um, my brother had this booklet, and I said, where'd you get that? He said, you go to the front. So I said, okay. So I went to the front. And next thing I knew, I was repeating after somebody a prayer. And I got my book. And um, so, you know, we can be fairly certain that was not sincere. Um, so <laughs> there was nothing of repentance. You know, it just, do you want to do this? Uh, you know, I'm here. And uh, so, uh, so depending on what it is, I mean, but... But it could be that somebody's, you know, genuinely has heard the gospel, has been called to repentance, and they are, you know, they seem remorseful of their sin, and they understand, you know, Christ is their only hope, and they're, and they just they want they want to pray, and so you you just tell them to pray or whatever, and and they do. How do we know how sincere that is? I think one thing, I mean, if they're just like completely detached emotionally from it, and they're just really seem bored, that's not a great sign. But ultimately, I guess, would be time. Uh, do, they, do they bear fruit? So this would be James, you know, what we looked at this morning. Seems like forever ago, does it not? Anyway, uh, James, you know, in, in time, does that, does that profession of faith bear some fruit? And again, when we talk about fruit, we're not talking about perfection of fruit. We're not talking about never again 
sinning in a way that you did before. But when you sin even, what, you know, what do you do with that? Do you repent of that? Do you, you know, again come back to Christ and find all your hope there and, and rest there and then, and then you know, seek to, to battle your flesh and, and mortify that sin? Um, so I, I think, you know, just part of it would be, uh, would just be, be time and, uh, and, and does, that, does that person bear fruit? Mike mentioned Sinclair Ferguson's book, um, The Whole Christ, and, and in that book, he, he, he does a great job of pointing out a, a place where I think people can fall into error and, and, and in, their, in their assurance is, am I, am I assured of my salvation because I'm trusting in Christ, or am I assured in my salvation because I'm trusting in my trusting in Christ? Am I, am I believing in my believing? And, and when we fall into that error, I think we, we start manufacturing evidence in our lives. We start working really hard. And all we're doing is, is, is working to prove that we're... And Mike did a great job. We need to just rest on Christ, period, and, and believe in Christ. And, and the sinner's prayer is not ideal. That's, I, I don't think that's where we should go. And, and, and yet, at, I, God is sovereign and powerful, and he saves whom he is going to save. And in spite of our terrible practices sometimes, God saves. Praise God. Yeah, and, and I think it's a mistake to think that the, the assurance of your salvation rests on the quality of the prayer you prayed or whether you prayed a prayer when you were saved. I, I, people are saved uh, whether they pray or not if they believe. And the examples in Scripture of people who, who got instant assurance from Christ include at least two examples that I can think of. They were very short, simple prayers. The thief on the cross just said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus gave him assurance of his salvation, not because of the words he said, but because of the faith he displayed. The same thing with the Luke 18, the uh, Pharisee and the uh, the publican in the in the uh, parable of the Pharisee and the publican. He went down to the temple and, and just prayed, "Lord, be merciful to me, uh, a sinner." That wasn't. That's not the kind of sinners. That is a classic sinners' prayer, but not the kind we normally teach people. To pray when they're doing evangelistic work it doesn't include any of the facts of the gospel uh, other than the fact that God is merciful he recognized that and Jesus said this man went down to his house justified so he was saved it wasn't because of the words he said it was because of the faith that was displayed in his heart and when I'm evangelizing it behooves me to remember that I don't care if the person prays or not uh, the question is the state of his heart, and the only proof that that's real is going to come subsequently with the fruit uh, that is born by his faith, if he continues in the faith. Yeah. In Luke 18, that, that's a great passage, and, and it literally in that, uh, the, the words that the tax collector prayed literally are, Lord, provide propitiation for me provide atonement for me. Like I, I realize that my sin is so grave. I need something outside of me to cover my sin. And Well, it also goes back to decisional regeneration, right? So you make a decision and then that flips the switch and now God is required to save you. And uh, I think of Luke 8 and the parable of the soils. Some people receive the word with what? Joy. But when trials come and other issues come up, then they fade away. So time uh, will reveal that, um, oftentimes to us, but even the, the person, too. And what are they trusting in and whom, to whom they place their trust? So I never try to um, say to people, if you believe, um, you know, believe so you can allow God to save. I just call people, believe and trust and to rest. Are you resting in Christ Jesus? Uh, I don't know if this has anything to do with anything, but I read this the other day, and you did mention assurance, Pastor Steve. Westminster Confession on Assurance. True believers may have the assurance of their salvation diverse ways shaken, diminished, and intermittent, 
as by negligence in preserving of it, by falling into some special sin which wounds the conscience and grieves the spirit, by some sudden or vehement temptation, by God withdrawing the light of his countenance, and suffering even such as fear him to walk in darkness and to have no light, yet they are never utterly destitute of that seed of God, and life of faith, that love of Christ and the brethren, that sincerity of heart and conscience of duty, out of which by the operation of the Spirit, this assurance may in due time be revived and by which in the meantime they are supported from utter despair. And so God's never going to lose that Christian. If you could lose your salvation, you already did. And sometimes God teaches us a lesson as he withdraws his assurance uh, for, uh, our assurance uh, from us to teach us. Excellent. Um, <laughs> uh, I guess, uh, are we wanting to wrap up close to well, six? Let's hear the question and see if it's the good. Envelope? Okay. Uh, can we, is it possible to summarize the gospel in one sentence? Yes. Let's close in prayer. Yeah, Paul, Paul does it in several places. It's not it, there's not a formula that's the, the uh, comprehensive, perfect summary of the gospel. But if you read the Apostle Paul, he loved to summarize the gospel in just a sentence or two. Like 1 Corinthians 5.21, God made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, uh, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. That's one example. Uh, Ephesians 2.8, which most of you already have memorized, so I won't quote it. And John 3.16. There are lots of verses in Scripture that summarize the gospel in one sentence. It's, that's not a sufficient and comprehensive gospel presentation in every case. Uh, but for some people, depending on where they're at in the state of the, the being drawn by the Holy Spirit and convicted of their sin, sometimes a single sentence like that might be enough to... Uh, you know, to enlighten them as to the gospel. Uh, but I, w I would never suggest that you should boil the gospel down to any kind of formula and present it the same way every time. You don't see Jesus doing that. And uh, uh, I, I just think that's, that's not a particularly good idea because some people are already under conviction of their sin. They need to be given the good news. There are lots more people these days who arrogantly think that God must love them because they love themselves so much and they need to be they need to be uh, shown the law and convicted of their sin uh, so it depends on the circumstance but yes it is possible I think to express sufficient gospel truth in one sentence that somebody could hear it and be saved Ephesians 5, uh, Ephesians, excuse me 1 Corinthians 15, 3, 4, and 5, in English at least, is one sentence. You have Christ the Messiah dying for our sins, not his. Uh, it's been prophesied in the Old Testament, and he was buried, that confirmed his death, and that he was raised, uh, and that he appeared. That's all one sentence. Okay, I can just keep going if you want, or someone will just plow me over and say no. But <laughs> you know, until you get one, we don't want to answer. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> um... What authors or speakers uh, would you strongly recommend as men who are dedicated to the truth of the gospel? I think one obvious one is John MacArthur, but we can expand from there. Dead men. <laughs> um, well, I don't know, I didn't, didn't say dead men, but you can list dead men if you want, it doesn't matter, either way. Yeah. Um, we have Spurgeon. Um, yeah, I don't know. There's a lot. Yeah. Um, so, I, I think one of the nice things about um, guys that have that are dead is that there's just you, you, their whole body of work is there. Their lives are before us. We know how they finished. It's just there's a it's there's a comfort there. Uh, there's no surprises yet to be found of what's going to happen tomorrow. Not to say that, you know, obviously we're still alive and hopefully um, worth listening to. But, um, but uh, so um, you can you can some of these guys you can't you can't listen to, but you can read their sermons. Um, and uh, um, Martin Lloyd Jones is one that I enjoy reading, and you can listen to him as well. 
Uh, I just. That's Lewis Johnson. Yeah. Um, so, I, I mean, I don't know. I don't know where to even begin, really, but I guess I'll just say Martin Lloyd Jones, see what you say. Tons, just tons. Spurgeon? Yeah, and I think the, the point he makes about uh, you know trusting the dead guys, because they won't come back and embarrass you, uh, it's an important one, because if you had asked me, say, four years ago, to name the preachers that maybe you've never heard of who I most appreciate, two of the guys that would have been my top five list have since disqualified themselves morally. And uh, uh, so I'm a little afraid to be giving any kind of blanket endorsement to any living individual. Uh, but, but the dead guys are trustworthy. <laughs> I have a sock drawer at home, and I put socks in that sock drawer. Uh, yes. Um, and I put some of my favorite books in that sock drawer, books that have affected my life uh, more than any other. And I just like to have them there. I don't know if the house burns, I, I grab my good socks and the books. And so these are some of my socks. You definitely want to save these socks. <laughs> they call John Owen a dandy for the way he dressed, by the way. Um, and so he, some of the books that are in that drawer, uh, one is J. Gresham Machen's Christianity and Liberalism. It's free, you can get it online, you ought to read that book. One of the books uh, that changed my life was The Imputation of Adam's Sin by John Murray, uh, understanding the difference between federal headship and Seminole or representative or something like that. So I read that one. Uh, Burkhoff's Systematic Theology. Uh, we, have an, we have a problem in evangelicalism now, and that is the pastors in most churches are giving people grudem. And Grudem has some good things, but he has some things you need to watch out for. And if you want to make your church charismatic the next generation, you give them Grudem. Because your next generation of church people will be charismatic. Uh, I know that's a little overstatement, but uh, so I like Burkhoff. I'd rather have them be Presbyterian than charismatic any day. Uh, uh, and I have Pink's Attributes of God there because I, I got to think about the attributes of God besides love. That book is also free. The Forgotten Spurgeon by Ian Murray is in that drawer because it was a real um, uh, uh, examination of the sovereignty of God and salvation during the time of Spurgeon and his ministry. And so all those books have something in common. They're kind of all written by older guys, but not that, not that old. And uh, I like to listen to S. Lewis Johnson preach. Uh, I like to listen to a pastor named Chris Gordon down at United Reformed Church in Escondido. I think he does a really good job for a 40-year-old uh, modern preacher. Um, I like to listen to podcasts at 1.5 speed so you can get more in there. Um, but I'm trying to think of who else we like to listen to. I like to listen to Sinclair Ferguson a lot. Um, I was asked upon my ordination, if I could ask the Lord for anything to help me in gospel ministry, what would I ask for? And I said, a Scottish accent. <laughs> um, I, I would add to the, to the sock drawer, yeah, um, the holiness of God. Our, our, yeah, uh, Sproul. Um, absolutely fantastic. For me, the life-changing book. Uh, I think it's one of the books that every Christian should read. All right. Um, do we have time for about two more questions, or can I add one thing? Give her. Since we're since it kind of got to books, not just listening to people. With the there was a question earlier about uh, had to do with Graham and and whatnot. Uh, Evangelicalism divided by Ian Murray is a really really helpful book that helps place where we are in the evangelical craziness. And uh, Murray's just a great writer and. Um, and I think charitable, and yet, you know, you know what he's thinking. And uh, he also gave a Shepherd's Conference, 2001. He, he gave a lecture summarizing that book. Um, so you can listen to that online. And both are, are really interested. The, the, the lecture will probably get you wanting to read the book. But those are, are really helpful, kind of eye-opening. So, okay. Okay, one more question. Um, <laughs> uh, 
Can the panel explain uh, what exactly is the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit and why is it so unforgivable? <laughs> yeah, uh, we can make this really short. I preached three sermons on that passage. Uh, and uh, uh, so if you just do a Google search for unpardonable sin and my name, you'll find those sermons amidst a bunch of accusations against me, but <laughs> <laughs> unpardonable sin. But uh, yeah, uh, the, the bottom line is that was a specific uh, statement that was leveled at some Pharisees who were standing right there who had just accused Jesus of doing miracles in the power of Satan, even though they knew, the, these guys knew that Jesus was legitimately the Messiah and they, they denied him deliberately, publicly in that way, standing there right after he'd done a miracle. And, um, and that was what made this an unpardonable sin. It was such a hard-hearted uh, blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, in whose power Jesus actually did do the miracle, that uh, he called it the unpardonable sin. And, he, and what's interesting about that passage is he prefaces it by saying, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven. So it's, it's actually preceded by a vast promise of forgiveness. He's not trying to make you and me worry that we might accidentally commit an unpardonable sin. What made this sin so egregious was the utter deliberateness of it, that these men made that denunciation of Christ with their eyes wide open. And so on the spot, he basically sealed their judgment forever and was telling those men that what they had just done would never be forgiven them. And, uh, and, and there's nothing else in Scripture that would ever encourage us to be fearful that we might accidentally commit some sin that's greater than the grace of God. 